Right, so um, what we did last time is we uh, have now fully derived all masses that uh, we decided to introduce in the context of the standard model. So we have the gauge boson masses, but we also have the fermion masses. And uh, we wrote down the Higgs potential. And I made a tiny mistake here. And uh, I had a, I think on the blackboard, I had a two here. So uh, people are watching my fingers. It's very good. So, and then, of course, because the standard model is a nice feature that the, the physical Higgs boson fluctuates around the vacuum expectation value just by knowing these masses and how they're expressed in terms of this uh, order parameter, i.e. the, uh, the higgs VEF, we can directly um, read off the Feynman diagrams or the, the, the Feynman rules for these particular interactions. So if you look at the MW squared, yeah, you express this in terms of um, uh, the vacuum expectation value. And in uh, spontaneously broken symmetries, it always works the same. Um, it's always a combination of the characteristic gauge coupling that comes because we deal with the covariant derivative, multiplies the, the VEF squared, and then you have a, a normalization factor. And uh, that is a 4 in each case. And then additional factors of 2 always just change between complex fields and, uh, and real fields. Okay. So um, if you replace now V squared by V plus H squared, which is really the, uh, the, uh, the thing that you would look at in unitary gauge, then you can expand this out and you can read off the mass term again, so nothing has changed here. But you get this characteristic combination of uh, coupling constant times the mass times uh, the mass term as in operator space times the dynamical Higgs field. Okay, so uh, this is always the sort of characteristic thing that arises when you do uh, electroweak symmetry breaking. So you end up with um, um, a Feynman rule that looks like this. So two of the Ws are coupled to one Higgs boson. And the coupling strength is given by uh, some uh, phase that actually never really matters unless you, you do it inconsistently, times the weak coupling, times the mass, and then, of course, the... Uh, um, uh, the Lorentz structure. Here, this guy is uh, just arising purely from a, a gauge interaction. So uh, you only deal with the g squared g mu nu. Okay? And in a similar way, we can already guess what will be the interactions of the Zs with the, uh, with the Higgs. Its characteristic coupling was um, the square root of g squared plus g prime squared, where g prime squared is the u1 hypercharge coupling, times the mass of the Z times the metric tensor, okay, and so on and so forth. So for, uh, for the fermion couplings, this is even easier, okay. So uh, the Yukawa couplings, they were fixed just by identifying the Yukawa coupling times the mass times square root of 2, um, inverse with the mass itself, and this you can replace with the VEF, and how you fluctuate everything around the um, the fermion mass, and you see that the Higgs couple is proportional to the mass itself. So this is uh, fairly straightforward. And I'm not going to show you all of this here, but you can see that now we want to deal a little bit with um, consistency checks of um, electroweak symmetry breaking. Are there any questions concerning the Feynman rules? Ah, fairly straightforward. All right, so... Um, what we want to achieve now is, um, well, what we have achieved is that we have uh, all these interactions. We have masses. Now we need to worry about um, whether this entire thing in a quantum field theory sense, especially when we apply perturbation theory as expressed through these Feynman diagrams, really makes sense. Um, and for this, let's have a look at a few consistency checks. And they were quite... Um, they gave the entire field quite some direction, and it makes sense. Essentially, that's the main motivation of how we uh, built the LHC and how the LHC was conceived as a machine. So let's have a look at um, what we have now at our disposal. So now we have um, massive vectors. And you can think of it in unitary gauge. Okay. So uh, we now have to deal with three degrees of freedom for our gauge fields because they are massive and not just two. Okay, so the photon field, we had this last time, has two transverse polarizations, but now 
the mass effect that picks up a longitudinal polarization. And that longitudinal polarization can be written as um, uh, like this in, uh, in, a, in, its, in its rest frame, where you have Pz and then everything is just aligned in, in z direction for convenience. Okay, and that of course only exists if the mass is really non-zero. If you set the mass to zero, it doesn't really work. So the thing that we can see here now is if we go to uh, energies of these um, gauge bosons, which are much, much bigger than their mass, then this will scale like the full momentum itself divided by the mass. All right. So, um, and that is potentially dangerous, okay? Because um, when you think about quartic gauge vertices, you have, uh, for instance, WW scattering. And if you look at the longitudinal degrees of freedom, then you can write down a, a whole bunch of Feynman diagrams that contribute to this. So the first of all, the first one is, of course, the, uh, the quartic vertex. Uh, and that's just a series and cobbled together versions of the metric tensor that you can look up in a, in a quantum field theory textbook. And, um, but in the end, it boils down to products here of, uh, of scalar products of the involved longitudinal polarizations of the gauge bosons. Okay? And because now each individual leg scales proportional to the energy, this Feynman diagram here, scales proportional to the uh, energy to the power of 4 if these legs carry an energy characterized by E. So this Feynman diagram alone will create a, a massive enhancement with, uh, with the energy of the incoming longitudinal Ws. So if you now look at um, the complete amplitude, so this is just you know, motivating as one part, of uh, WW scattering. So if you look at the whole thing, just by looking at uh, what is the maximum amount that you can increase your amplitude at uh, high energy, so essentially what I'm trying to do is write down a Taylor expansion of uh, this particular amplitude. So I know naively there will be terms e to the power of 4, then everything below that in principle. Okay? So this will have a form. It scales with alpha to the power 4, e to the power 4, plus alpha 2, e squared, plus alpha naught, e naught. And then, so constant terms, and I'm not really worried about additional terms here. Okay. So, these terms I, I don't really care so much about because um, they are not really dangerous. So these terms, proportional to e to the power of 4 and e squared, they can really harm our probabilistic interpretation of the scattering process, because diverging amplitudes means diverging probabilities, and this should not be the case. Okay? We started with a, um, with a Hermitian Lagrangian. So this implies a, a, a unitary S matrix. Okay? But now I... I truncate my series expansion here, maybe at leading order. So just purely applying perturbation theory might actually violate this concept of, uh, of uh, unitarity, um, uh, i.e. probability conservation. So I need to make sure that you know, nothing, nothing crazy happens here. Otherwise, you know, we are at dead end and we can't do calculations for the LHC. Okay, so... Um, S matrix elements should be well behaved. In the ultraviolet, so if you go to E to infinity. So and they will be, but maybe non-perturbatively, okay? And this is what we want to check. So the optical theorem. allows you to make a sort of strong statement based on uh, 
uh, zero path of wave scattering here. So you essentially write down this amplitude and you project it onto um, Legendre polynomials. So you look at um, uh, angular momentum decomposition of that amplitude. And then with increasing um, angular momentum, uh, typically the impact uh, decreases. So the, uh, the zeroth partial wave is really the, the most dominant one here. And um, that tells us that uh, you can write A0 as a 1 divided by 16 pi s, where s is just the Mandelstam is, so the center of mass uh, energy squared. And you integrate from minus s to 0 um, the absolute value of m over Mandelstam t. So where m is the, uh, the complete amplitude. And if you look at this, then um, you can unitarity, unitarity uh, conservation then means a constraint on A0. And there are various versions of this, and uh, we can have a look at any of them, really. And uh, we, one of this would be that the real part of this is smaller than one half. Okay. So if, if you violate this, then you break unitarity in a perturbative sense. So you can already see that this can happen, really, if you allow for, uh, for increases of energy with the power of 4 or 2. So if you go to high enough energies, this will grow, and this will be violated. So something has to happen um, in order to circumvent that. And this is really where gauge invariance, but also spontaneous symmetry breaking now go hand in hand. So first of all, we have... Uh, this term that scales proportional e to the power of 4. You know, and this is a calculation that I think every grad student has to do if they are interested in, uh, in Higgs physics, really. Then, of course, you have other gauge interactions, where well, this could be a, a photon or a z. And if you evaluate that, plus it's a t channel partner, then you see this grows with e to the power of 4 as well. So bad, 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 bad. However, the magic of um, gauge invariance, if you sum the two of them, you see that the total overall growth is just proportional to e squared. So why is that? Well, you can do the calculation, you'll find it out. but. Um, Essentially, this vertex here is just the squared vertex of this times, you know, cosine squared, sine squared. So if you go to large enough energies, the mass suppression here of the Z boson doesn't really matter anymore. Then you have this as a sine squared or cosine squared, if you deal with a photon or a Z. They add up, and essentially you deal with the same two copies here of, uh, of the coupling there. And this is how you sort of merge and only leave you with an E squared growth. Okay, so you can write down a sum rule that guarantees the absence of this uh, e to the power of 4 growth. And this would be that the, the interaction vertex of the four-point um, interaction here is GWWZ squared plus a GWW gamma squared. Okay, so if you go back and or you go at a, uh, have a look at them at a quantum field theory textbook. So this is just a g squared. This is a, e squ a g squared times cosine squared. This is a g squared times sine squared. Sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. So this sum rule is fulfilled just by having a gauge invariant um, uh, field theory in the gauge sector by, by construction, if you wish. But of course, we still have to worry about this e squared term. Okay. And um, this is where the Higgs now comes in, because we have the Higgs here in the S channel, but also in the T channel when I suppress. And if you evaluate that diagram, you'll find that this also scales with E squared. And in such a way that these add up to E to the power of zero in the high energy limit. And high energy limit means that we are looking at energies or center of mass energies much higher than 
particle thresholds here. Okay, and the associated sum rule that you can find for that would be a 4 times mw squared times the vertex is equal to 3mz squared gwwz squared plus gwwh squared. Okay. So you can see that there is a nice sort of geometric uh, understanding of the sum rule. So you deal with four w's and the quartic coupling, the w mass is mw squared. You have three polarization states of the z that get mediated here, wwz coupling. You have no mass for the photon, so it doesn't appear here. But gwwh is just related um, to uh, the w mass generation, so you get a g times mw essentially. So all of these things add up and uh, this uh, sum rule is enforced through exactly that mass relation that mw squared divided by mz squared is the cosine squared of the Weinberg angle. Okay, so this is very sensitive to the tree level way how you uh, uh, generate gauge boson masses with the, with the doublet width. No. So that's, a, that's just an implication of, uh, of spontaneous symmetry breaking itself. Which means that uh, if you were to break um, electroweak symmetry with, with triplets, you would get identical um, sum rules that would look different though. So this is the whole idea that Como, Levin and Tectopoulos took in the 70s, write down this amplitude, and then you try to sort of reverse engineer what the couplings might be here. And you can see there is no choice other than that the Higgs coupling to the two Ws is exactly like that. It's exactly like G times MW. And that you can only create through, uh, through spontaneous symmetry breaking. So this is sort of, you know, in a hand wavy argument proves that this is something particular to uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, but not constrained by how you break electric symmetry. So if you dealt with a, um, with a triplet, you would have same sign W uh, scattering, right? And that is, does, does not appear in, uh, in, in the standard model, well, through photons and stuff, okay? But then you get doubly charged Higgses in, uh, in the S channel, and then of course you get new sum rules, and you know, the way this is implemented is, becomes non-trivial. But irrespective of how you do this, you always end up with a good high energy behavior. Sorry? So this guy is proportional to G times MW. Right. So from this we see that this term is gone. This term is gone. So the only thing that's left here is, uh, is e to the power of zero in the Taylor expansion. So that's, that's okay. You know, this will not violate uh, the perturbative unitarity bound on a zero partial wave unitarity. But in principle, you could argue that maybe this alpha naught is so large that this one divided by two actually gets saturated. And then you're in, in, in the pickles again. So uh, the only term that survives here Is uh, this alpha naught? And uh, if you calculate a zero w w w w w w w w goes to w w, I give you the uh, um, the result. What you get for center of mass energy squared much bigger than the Higgs mass squared, you get an m h squared divided by eight pi v squared. So if the Higgs mass is too big, then you break unitarity, 
well, you don't really break unitarity, but what this tells you is that higher order corrections um, become relevant. And they become relevant in such a way that uh, the next to leading order electric corrections would sort of mend exactly this growth. So each order of perturbation theory will become naively of the same order. So you start actually pushing into the strongly interacting limit of your electric uh, sector. So if perturbation theory is a, is a good thing, you know, and if nature chooses to live in a, in a region of parameter space where, where it admits the application of perturbation theory, um, then something has to happen before this constraint gets saturated by the Higgs mass. Okay? And this is called the unitarity bound. which limits uh, MH to uh, be lighter than roughly 900 GeV. There are other processes. There is not only WW scattering, there's also WZ scattering and so on and so forth. So in principle, you have to look at all these scattering processes and then take um, the maximally constraining one, okay? So in, in the space of... Uh, uh, longitudinal gauge boson scattering amplitudes. And you can now can see that there is actually, is actually not really a, a coincidence that um, all these Higgs exclusion bounds that you see start at 114 or so. This is where LEP lost its sensitivity. And they go up to 1 TeV. This is exactly where, where perturbation theory breaks down and you would see some strongly interacting sector. Okay? And this is really the, uh, uh, the motivation behind the LHC being a no-loose experiment, because we knew the X is either there or we find something else. Yeah. And we find something else, for instance, so something that was uh, quite um, fashionable when I went to grad school, were models uh, of extra dimensions. Okay, so my name is uh, Englert, and I worked on Higgsless models in, uh, during my master's, so <laughs> people find that funny, and it is funny. So, essentially what you can do is you can throw away this guy here entirely and replace it with copies of, uh, of gauge bosons of type spin 1. Yeah. And you can write this down as a five-dimensional you know, ads cft inspired theory. And uh, then you get tight constraints on where these extra vector resonance should sit. You, know, and you can think of it as strongly interacting, you know, Higgsless scenarios. You can bring the Higgs back in. So you can dial away part of electric symmetry breaking from the Higgs into you know, a strongly interacting sector, for instance. So you can take um, these sum rules and really play with them phenomenologically, yeah? in a sense that you can predict where, where new stuff sits. Okay, so the, the LHC really was a, a no-lose experiment in that sense. But you also can see that uh, this unitarity stuff is really a, a major motivation of beyond the standard model um, Higgs searches. So, and in particular, um, Higgs precision coupling searches. So if we measure, say, a deviation of 10% here of the Higgs coupling to the Ws relative to the standard model, so if that deviates from this value, then we are you know, back to square one, which means that at high scales we get unitarity violation, and that can only be circumvented if, if new degrees of freedom pop up that exactly compensate for this effect. Yeah? So you, this gives a very, very strong argument uh, to look into very specific processes at the LHC, and we'll discuss this later on. Yeah. The same problem. Ye yes and no, because I mean, five-dimensional theories are intrinsically non-renormalizable, so they always come with a cutoff. So you get this entire kaluza klein tower of states, and if you look at the heaviest one then by definition they would get you know, unitarity violation because you don't know really what lies beyond that cutoff. Um, cutoff is played by the UV brain. Um, the source of these things, and there's actually a nice, uh, if, you, if you're interested really in 5D theories for instance, or ADD scenarios as well, the source of this is uh, um, completeness relations of wave functions in the fifth dimension. So it's essentially a, a uh, a completeness relation, you know, Fourier modes, if you wish. And this is how you prove this as well. So 
So any modification of fixed couplings, though, away from the standard model value, will tell us that something else has to be there. Okay? And this is why people are you know, very, very concerned about getting the precision of these fixed couplings you know, nailed down. So let's uh, have a look at one example where, where this actually uh, takes place. And Jim already discussed this uh, singlet mixing um, uh, Higgs portal sort of scenario. And this is quite nice to have a look at this in this context as well. So um, as an example, we have uh, the uh, singlet extended standard model and uh, can write down a potential that uh, depends now not only on the Higgs sector but also on some hidden sectors. I can take a mu s squared phi s squared for the visible stuff plus a lambda s phi s to the power of 4 and uh, you have the same thing mirrored in the hidden sector mu squared phi h squared plus a lambda phi h to the power of 4. And because the squared of these guys are, are singlets, you can also mix them. Okay. Plus an eta x phi s squared phi h squared. So this is a perfectly renormalizable theory. Lambda h. Okay, so you can find the minimum of this potential, but that's not too relevant. But what we see if both the visible sector or the hidden sector, well, both at the same time, so both phi s and phi h obtain a vacuum expectation value, then this will lead to exactly this mixing between phi s and phi h. Okay, so you are, this leads to terms, uh, eta x, Vs Vh times Hs and Hh for like the scalar modes around this uh, uh, these vacuum expectation values and of course this we have to diagonalize now so this leads to a uh, two states H1 and H2 and they are related to uh, the eigenstates here of the Lagrangian through again a two-dimensional uh, rotation matrix and the angle I just call Xi here. Okay, so so then uh, this mixing is gone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is just an example, right? You typically would imply some discrete symmetry to get rid of these terms, yeah? Doesn't matter for this, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's take complex. What matters for, for the argument is that this is non-zero. Yeah? Because what happens now is that uh, this vertex, W, W, Hs, and this is everything that would be in the standard model, gets rotated by, uh, by this cosine square. Yeah. So you deal now with the uh, H1 and the H2, and this couples proportional to the cosine of this uh, mixing angle, and this couples proportional to the sine of this mixing angle. But now it's already given here, right? So you just close it to longitudinal W's, you get exactly the same coupling here as you get here. And above the threshold, this mixing will just add up coherently. So typically what's done, at least in, in the LHC Fino community, is that the lightest state of the two is identified as the standard model Higgs. There's no particular reason for that, and there are exceptions, of course, and the H2 would be heavier. But if you're above the H2 threshold, then you 
have both degrees of freedom running in uh, the uh, WWS and T channels, and their amplitude adds up to exactly the standard model value. Yeah? Because cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. So you can see that uh, I haven't really done much, and it's a sort of minimalistic scenario, but you can see that this modification that modifies, that includes mixing after electric symmetry breaking, is, uh, does not impact unitarity um, conservation at high energies. Are there questions? Yeah? There's no reason for that. We can assume that. The, uh, the sum of these two only obtains a value that is the standard model if you're above both mass th thresholds. At this, at this point, it doesn't really matter. When you start worrying about Higgs coupling constraints and uh, branching ratios, then of course this changes. But this, for this argument, it doesn't really matter. But I agree, yeah. So as a, as a fully fledged model, there are additional constraints that you have to worry about. But the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, if you're above the mass thresholds, you get back exactly the standard model uh, contribution. So unitarity is restored. But unitarity is not really the most constraining bit here um, that limits. If you assume now that H1 would be uh, the light Higgs, yeah, 125 GeV, and this would be heavier, say 5, 6, 700 GeV, then you get a unitarity constraint which is pretty much identical to, uh, to this guy here, right? Because it happens below 900 GeV. But if you then study electric position effects, that are induced by exactly these coupling deviations, you find a much, much stricter bound. And uh, this is what I want to do in the following. Any uh, other questions? No? All right. So I'll upload these handwritten notes to, uh, to the Twiki, because I don't want to write down all these numbers now. But I... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about electric position observables because they are really like bread and butter physics for uh, theoretical particle physics physicists. So, uh, so what's the motivation behind all of this? We um, we have now all these parameters that we can fix. So we know we can fix the VEF through uh, the Fermi constant. We have alpha that we can, for instance, so the electroweak, uh, uh, the electromagnetic coupling. A fine structure constant, we can measure this from uh, low energy electron scattering. So we have a plethora of uh, input parameters, even we have more measurements than we actually have input parameters to the electric, um, to the electric sector. So now you can start doing fits and try to see if the correlation between different parameters shows you some tension. Okay, so if this picture is not consistent, then uh, you can take some of these observables and predict others, and if you're some uh, sigma soft, then you should shout new physics. Okay? So this is the whole idea of this effective field theory business as well. So we do a little bit of an approximation into this through, through the Peskin Takeuchi parameters. So let's do this in this particular case. So you take uh, alpha, gf, mz squared, and uh, mw, for instance, and you use these uh, pseudo-observables or observables to relate them to uh, the fundamental parameters of your Lagrangian, okay? So we know that uh, this measured value here with the hat is related to the ele electric coupling by E squared divided by 4 pi. So you can f fix E that way. You know the Fermi constant is related to the vacuum expectation value. So with this you can fix V. Now you go back uh, to uh, what was written before, so mz squared is just related to g squared plus g prime squared, square root of that times v squared divided by 4. But now you have e, you have v, and uh, sine squared theta and cosine squared theta, you can infer those from um, weak current interactions. So all of these things are measurable, okay? For example, like this. So you throw in as many, in as many 
parameters, parameters that you need, but actually I'm, I'm using here more than I really need. So you can, I mean, you get, get the drift, right? So you, you fix all these parameters, and at the end of the day, you say predict the, um, um, the L plus, L minus, so the Z um, decay width into leptons. Or you do something different, you include that into your input parameter set and predict the, uh, the W mass. And if you do this, and all of these things are super precisely measured, as you can see, with my horrible handwriting, you can see that uh, actually, some of these parameters, you can calculate this or you just believe me, are actually off by five sigma. Yeah? And much more than that, some of them are off by 10 or 12 sigma. So this means actually what all of what I told you is, uh, it wasn't really worth the two hours that we spend. Of course, this is not the end of the standard model, but it tells you that if you increase the precision of your measurement, then radiative corrections become important. So leading order physics, once uh, your stuff is precise enough, uh, stuff meaning measurements, um, requires you to work harder, yeah? uh, harder in terms of perturbation theory. So um, how does this work? Okay, so I, I walk you very quickly through this because uh, it's sort of very mathy. You know, there's lots of, it's not super complicated algebra, but it's, it's a lot of it. So, um, <coughs> the point here is that what uh, you have, of course, if you look at E plus E minus scattering, for instance, to a Q, Q bar, that's really what was done at lab, E plus E minus. So you have Z or gamma, and you observe this in to quarks, then at higher orders you can write all sorts of uh, corrections to it. You can, for example, write a loop here, or you can write a loop here, or you can also write loops here, for instance, right? So you can have a Higgs, for instance, like this. Okay, and some of these, uh, you can think about this being really a new physics field that impacts this measurement in the low energy regime. And if you assume that uh, it, whatever this new physics is, it, it couples predominantly to, uh, to the gauge bosons, then uh, new physics corrections of this sort of type, they will not be dominant, but it will be stuff that relates to uh, corrections of the two-point functions of all gauge bosons. So if you assume now that this is the case, then you can write, um, uh, your new effective interaction below whatever the mass scale is of whatever runs in the loop here as uh, the standard model plus some new interactions and these new interactions will only modify um, the kinetic terms or the mass terms of the associated gauge fields. So these are related to exactly the two-point functions. So integrating out these states you end up with a uh, some number A that, um, that we would like to measure, and number B, C, G, W, and uh, Z. Okay. And because we like perturbation theory so much, what we have to do to apply it is uh, shifting and renormalize these fields such that we deal with canonical normalizations. And uh, this is where it gets a little bit you know, tedious working through these things. And if you like Mathematica, you can probably do this very quickly. So in order to get rid of this, you rescale A just by absorbing exactly this, uh, this additional factor. And there's, a, there's additional margin here for um, photon Z mixing, um, which is given here. Yeah? So this is parameter G. You do this with the W fields, and you do this with the Z fields. Okay, and you work at linear order, because you assume that these parameters are reasonably small, so new physics is heavy or weakly coupled, or probably both. And if you do that by construction, you end up with uh, kinetic terms, so you don't really need to sort of copy all of this away. I'll, I'll put this onto the, the Twiki. Um, but now all of these coupling changes will, of course, affect here um, the modifications of the W mass, because this piece yeah, will, will feel whatever kind of field redefinition I've done. So now my mw squared 
has this additional factor of b, and my z squared has this additional factor of minus c. But even more so, the interactions of uh, the w's and the z's with, um, um, with fermions will be modified as well. Okay, and this is now you see why I, um, why I do this here on the projector, because uh, writing this on the blackboard is a, is a pain. Uh, so, similarly, you will rescale the, um, the electromagnetic currents, the charge currents, and the neutral currents, and you will also modify them through exactly this additional G factor, okay? And I should have said that the bar quantities are really standard model quantities. So I'm allowed to use standard model relations for, for quantities that, are, that have a bar over them. Okay, so uh, now we actually have quite a, quite a horrible Lagrangian that we're dealing with. The only thing that's really you know, nice to us is, are the, the gauge kinetic terms, and we don't really need to worry about that anymore. But, and I keep going on about this all the time, none of these parameters is really physical, but they are related to physical quantities through measurements. So now we can eliminate some of these guys through, uh, through measurements, okay? So for instance, we can take the electric coupling, the Z mass, and the sine of the Weinberg angle and work them out. So we can fix um, E through electron scattering at low energy. So we know that this uh, essentially gives you the fine structure constant. And you can take this as a definition of uh, E, okay? And you match it to your new coupling that is shifted by this uh, additional factor of A. And there's a factor of uh, 2 compared to here because we're dealing with A squared and then linearized. So what this means here is that uh, you do the measurement. So you measure like a cross-section of uh, electron scattering at a given energy. And typically, you would do it at zero momentum transfer. And this is really what this left-hand side here summarizes. And you use just the standard model relation to define an E that you like. Okay. What this means is, is a placeholder for a, a physical cross-section. Yeah? So this is the idea of renormalization over and over again, but here in a, in a, in a finite kind of way. So you do this with the, uh, uh, the Fermi constant as well. And uh, this gets a bit more. Uh, worse, if you wish. So you calculate the muon decay, use all the modifica modifications of the Feynman rules that arise through these field rescalings. And if you do that, you end up with an equation that looks like this. Okay. And remember that these BART quantities are standard model quantities, so I can use the standard model relations to put these in. Okay. So the standard model prediction for this, we, uh, we never really worked out, but it looks like this. And I can use now essentially the, uh, the measurement of muon decay understood as a function of uh, the Weinberg angle to fix the Weinberg angle in, uh, in this new modified theory. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to write um, s theta bar as a function of s theta. And uh, this can be done. And you have something like this. All right, so quite, uh, quite horrible. So it's essentially what we are doing here. And you know, don't, don't worry about the, the algebra. It's really not too important. Um, it's just trying to identify how these parameters and how these new physics sources get you know, shifted around in the Lagrangian and what they later on really mean in physical quantities. So if we've done that, then by construction, I mean, because we use the Z-mass as, as an input parameter, really, the Z-mass will be exactly what it should be, will be mz squared divided by 2 times Z squared as a, as a Lagrangian operator. The electromagnetic um, current will be exactly the same as you would expect in the standard model. So you know, it's fixed through a, um, electron scattering at low energies. But the W mass is a bit more complicated, OK? So uh, essentially, now you've shifted 
all these parameters, all these modifications that we scaled our photon field, that we scaled the Z field, the W field, the W mass, the Z mass, you've all absorbed them into a modified prediction of uh, the W mass. So W mass now looks like MZ squared plus all of this clutter. So the currents are, of course, the same. You know, they, they get complicated as well for the W. But now you can go on and say measure the W mass as a function of the set mass, as a function of uh, the Fermi constant, and so on and so forth, and compare all of these things. Right? So equations no, are not the end of it, but you can make it, you know, a qualitative statement. So we deal here with uh, six parameters, okay? We have the, uh, the photon field strength, the Z field strength, the W field strength, the Z uh, photon mixing, and two masses. So we have six parameters. Three of those we can absorb into a redefinition of uh, um, the associated gauge fields. So we are left with three combinations of these parameters which are really physically relevant. And these are exactly the, uh, the Pesky and Takeuchi parameters. So, uh, in terms of um, these ABCs and uh, Gs, they are written like this. So, you have the famous S parameter and the T parameter. So, there's no reason why you need to learn this by heart. But what I want to say is that these are dimension six. So, uh, you would expect them to be you know, leading deformations of the standard model because you know, there are no dimension 5 operators in, in, a, in the standard model as far as I'm concerned. And uh, the T parameter in particular gets rather, rather simple. Okay? So it's just remember that the small z and the small w were just new contributions to the w and the z mass. So the T parameter, as I said earlier, really gives you a shift of uh, the relation that we found through custodial isospin. So that mw squared divided by mz squared divided by cosine squared theta is equal to 1. And the t parameter picks up on exactly modifications of this relation. Okay? And that comes about by comparing charge currents and the neutral current interactions with masses. Okay? So if you have these interactions measured and you have the z mass, you have a, a prediction for the, um, for the w mass. And if you can arrange them such that they are, they are one, then we would exactly get back the leading order um, expression that, uh, that we're after. So I said that um, these things are related to, uh, to gauge boson two-point functions. They have to be because essentially what we are dealing here with is a field strength renormalization and the mass renormalization. They are fully encoded in the two-point functions. So if you look at the at a propagator here and you write the self-energy and you do a normal Lorentz decomposition of it, then you get a GMU new term because there have to be two uh, gauge indices, uh, two uh, Lorentz indices. So you get a scalar function and you get a, um, a function that depends on P mu, P nu. So we saw that these guys are typically related to gauge degrees of freedom. It's not really that important. So everything you need to calculate really is a uh, is one loop diagrams to the Z and the photon and the W and the Z photon mixing and you extract the prefact of G mu nu and you can calculate all of this very straightforwardly very straightforwardly in the sense that uh, you have to put all of this stuff into an equation like that yeah. so uh, but the good news is you code this up once yeah, and you can use it over and over again now, and, uh, there, of course, there are ultraviolet singularities appearing here and there, but in the final result, because these things are related ultimately to, to uh, experimental observables, they will cancel. Okay? So, if you're not, uh, you know, uh, not so inclined to do German physics, you know, loops and renormalization and all of that, and, and you don't dig ultraviolet divergences, then this is an easy way around because if there are any ultraviolet divergencies left over, you've done a mistake. Yeah. Okay. So this is, uh, it's, it looks complicated, but it's fairly straightforward. Okay. So, and typically when we do this, we, uh, we relate it to, uh, to the standard model itself and measure delta S and delta T and delta U against the standard model best fit point. So um, 
For example, in our singlet mixing scenario, just give you the result, you get uh, a contribution to the S parameter that looks like this, and then get a contribution to uh, the T parameter that looks like this. Okay, so it scales logarithmically with uh, mh squared, and uh, in in um, in both observable delta S and delta T. So also when the mixing goes to zero, you see that you recover the standard model. So S psi goes to zero. The top quark, on the other hand, so I, I don't show you um, relations for that, but the top quark would enter here quadratically. So actually it's the, the difference between the top and the bottom quark mass because that's also a source of chirality, which S ultimately measures, and a, a violation of custodial lysis spin because we used phi charge conjugate and phi to generate up and down quark masses. Yeah. So we really make a difference here for the SU2 and hypercharge breaks it as well, so you would get a, a contribution in the standard model here that is G prime proportional and logarithmically with the Higgs mass, and then linear in the mass difference of mt squared minus mb squared. Okay, so uh, that was quite heavy. Uh, so let's, let's have a look at, um, if I can operate this, at how constrained these parameters really are. Okay. So uh, I think that's input one. There you have it. Okay, so uh, this is um, German collaboration G-Fitter. They do all the fancy electric physics stuff. So they do complete electric fits using all sorts of stuff, you know, including corrections like this. But they also are nice enough to break that down to, uh, to our beloved S and T parameters, okay? So, uh, you can see that this is the ellipse that is, uh, this is the left, 68, 95, 99% confidence level. So the higher the confidence level, the more sure you are that you really cover the, the physically true point. And you can, we had this bound of 900 GeV, right? And you can see that this is really weak compared to uh, what's happening here. So this is from September 2012, so this is shortly. Uh, well, this is aligned with the Higgs discovery. So you can see that if you're at the best fit point sits here, and you slightly, slightly, slightly increase the Higgs mass, you're outside 99% confidence level. Okay, so this is this plot alone. After the top mass was uh, discovered, and you know its mass value was consolidated because, as I said, this is a dominant contribution to S and T. This was really one of the most constraining plots that you could think of to constrain the Higgs in the context of the standard model. Okay, so. 130 GeV Higgs was already ruled out, in a way. But you know, people love this plot. Um, these days, maybe not so much anymore. But you know, back in my days, people absolutely loved it. Yeah. So um, usually, these groups. This, first of all, the U contribution here in our singlet model would be zero. Okay, but it's. So in this fit, it's set to zero by hand. They also have stuff where they let u flow, but the naive power counting argument between s and t and u is that you would expect s and t to, to dominate in terms of contributions. So this is a motivation to break it down into a, a nice you know, uh, palatable format for us theorists. Okay. Uh -huh. So if you move out with the mix, you, you violate it very, very quickly. So our 900 GeV unitarity bound would sit here. Um, so you see this is completely uh, disfavored by um, electric precision data. Now people like Tillman in the days, they realized that, okay, you can actually you get a positive contribution to S from the Higgs mass and a negative contribution to T. But if you throw in additional fermions, yeah, if you're lucky enough, you can shoot yourself back into the ellipse up here. And this was the whole idea of introducing a, a fourth uh, generation of standard model-like fermions. Okay. Uh, Tillman can, can tell you all the details of how the PDG got it wrong and, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But now it's ruled out there is no fourth generation um, 
because we now know that the Higgs production cross-section does not allow for the presence of a heavy top quark in, on top of that. That would enhance the cross-section quite dramatically. And we've seen a cross-section that is consistent with the standard model, so no need to worry about uh, a fourth generation here. So, are there any questions related to, uh, to this? Yeah? Uh, it's slightly smaller, okay, but um, I think this already includes the Higgs mass, okay? So uh, the uh, 125.7 plus minus, you know, 0 0.4, that has gone down a little, so this becomes more constraining, but uh, not much has really changed. Uh, this is already super constraining, so I mean, uh, if you write down a model that has anything to do with electric symmetry breaking, and you calculate S and T, you typically end up here, or here, or here, or here. So it's really a, it's a, it's a kick in the bum. So and this is also why, you know, you shouldn't mistake it for like, just calculate S, T, and U, and if you lie in the ellipse, then, you know, you're fine. This is like, a, it's the first step, and it's an approximation to the full electric corrections. Um, that includes the whole lot here. So you would call these oblique corrections because they appear universally uh, in processes that involve electric bosons. And the stuff that impacts, say, forward back with the symmetries of B quarks at lab, we call them non-oblique because they are really specific to, to one particular particle. And that's quite hard to work. It's hard to work that out, but typically we don't do this as phenomenologists. Okay? So you look for S and T, make a scan, identify the points that fall into the 99% confidence level uh, contour, and then you write the paper, okay? And leave the hard stuff to uh, people who have more time and more patience. Um, yeah. Any uh, other questions? No? Yeah? I don't quite know how to answer this apart from you have to do the calculation. But the, uh, the, the Feynman diagrams that enter here. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the S and T parameter are logarithmically sensitive to, uh, to the Higgs mass. Um, these diagrams here, wave function corrections, they're always related to uh, B functions in the Passarina Wildmann type of uh, um, approach. And uh, these are logarithmically dependent on the masses. So if you look at uh, the two point function in the Feynman diagram, you translate this into an algebraic expression, you'll see that this will be logarithmically dependent. And this is a statement that we're living in four dimensions, really. Uh, okay, how much time? 15 more minutes. Oh, tough, tough, yeah, the afternoons. Um, let's do something nice at the end, okay? So now we know that 125 GV is actually quite nice. Um, but are, are there any other constraints that might come around when we actually have 125 GV? So, you know, this plot tells you 125 GeV Higgs in the light of everything that you can expect from lab measurements and so on and so forth is pretty much bang on. Yeah? So we don't seem to have a problem with the standard model as such, you know, apart from the obvious shortcomings, you know, no dark matter, etc., etc. But are there any conceptual shortcomings of the standard model itself? Because that looks like everything seems to be nice in place. Yeah? So um, 
let's have a look at some other constraints that relate to the uh, evolution of the electric sector to high energies. Right, so none of these parameters in the Lagrangian are really physical, but the whole process of renormalization allows you to fi fix their value through a measurement at one scale and then infer their value at a higher scale just through RGE flow and you can calculate this from, uh, from perturbation theory. So if you do this for the self-coupling, if you do a D log Q squared, where Q squared is uh, it's a renormalization scale that you can translate into a physical uh, external momentum scale at fixed renormalization scale through the um, kellen semanchik equations, then uh, in the standard model it looks like this at leading order. So at one loop is a 12 lambda squared plus a 6 lambda y top minus a 3 y top to the power of 4 minus 3 half lambda 3 g squared plus a g prime squared plus a 3 divided by 16 2 g to the power of 4 plus a g squared plus a g prime squared squared and big brackets. So in order for the standard model Higgs sector to be well defined up to arbitrary energies, really, we want a stable, it, it has to have a stable vacuum configuration. So remember that this scale, the phi to the power of four term, okay, and we have to have that positive, otherwise, you know, we just fall into a, a potential well. So if the um, potential in the, that we calculated looked like this, okay, so we really needed lambda bigger than zero to be trapped here. So now let's look at uh, this RGE equation here for um, for different scenarios. So in the first one is that uh, we look at the case where lambda is actually large. Okay? When lambda is larger than all the other parameters that sit in here, then this term will dominate the RGE flow at large lambda values. Okay? And if you do that, you get uh, d lambda by d log squared q is a 12 lambda squared divided by 16 pi squared so you can solve this and you get a lambda of q squared so you call it a lambda of v squared so we fix it at the electric scale and you multiply a 1 minus 3 divided by 4 pi squared lambda at v squared times the log of q squared divided by v squared minus 1. Okay, so you can see that if you evolve this now to high enough scales above uh, the initial condition that we feed into the system at uh, the electric VEF, this becomes a positive number. And if that number becomes big enough, then uh, you can get this equal to 1 here. So you hit the Landau pole which you want to avoid, because then you know, something else has to happen that is not the standard model. And if you want to have the standard model as we know it, in terms of this picture, to survive to, uh, to arbitrarily high energies, or the Planck scale, um, you have to require that this Landau pole does not appear before. Okay? And because we saw that the Higgs mass is related to lambda, this sets a constraint on the Higgs mass itself. Yeah. So, uh, and it sets... Um, upper limit on MH. <laughs> also important, we know that, is the top Yukawa coupling because that's of order one the top mass in units of VEF divided by square root of 2 is roughly 1. 
Okay, so this is quite a big parameter as well. So, uh, and it has a negative sign because of Fermi statistics. Okay? So, uh, for small lambdas now, so if uh, yt dominates, so this is in uh, regions where lambda is small, you get a uh, running of lambda d log q squared equals to minus 3 divided by 16 pi squared times y top to the power of 4. And this is an approximate solution that you get uh, lambda of v squared minus a 3 y top divided by 16 pi squared log q squared divided by v squared. And again, you can see that if you go to a uh, high enough energies, you can actually change the sign in, uh, in lambda. Okay, and then at high enough energies, this would just fall over, and you would not live in a, in a stable vacuum configuration anymore. Okay. So these, uh, that sits um, a lower limit on MH, because lambda has to be small, i.e. the Higgs mass has to be small. So this, uh, these guys are called the, uh, the vacuum stability bound and the triviality bound. And people have looked into this uh, in quite some, some detail. So uh, this is actually going one order higher in perturbation theory. So it's really next to next to leading order, quite cutting edge. And um, this is the Higgs board decoupling. And you evaluate it over a whole range of, uh, of scales. And you fix all input parameters at the weak scale to be like the stuff that we see. And indeed, we see that. Uh, for large enough values, you actually dip into uh, the negative regime of um, um, the potential. So this starts to bend over, and uh, we are not really in the true um, vacuum anymore. Okay, and you can see also that uh, so the width of this band uh, relates to uncertainties in the input parameters m top and uh, alpha strong at z mass and so on and so forth. So if you now translate this into, um, into a plot that tells you whether we should uh, be having this conversation or not, meaning that uh, we actually should be tunneling into a, into a new vacuum, you know, that would have quite violent um, implications. And you can see that actually the parameters are such that we live in a, in a, in a region that is characterized by meta stability, so where, where things can decay, but you know, it's not super, super likely. Okay, so much longer decay uh, life uh, expectations than the, the, the lifetime of the universe. Okay, so essentially this calculation you can do with a WKB approximation. And so we are away at the three sigma level from the stability region. But obviously, otherwise you wouldn't be talking to me. We are not living in an instability region. Yeah? They are, they just refer to... Um, how far you extrapolate this. So uh, it would be like the Q squared max on, on the other plot. All right, so, um, so this tells you that somehow we, uh, in the standard model, we are quite in quite a, a, a delicate situation, OK? So uh, if you look at this in a, in a blown up picture, where we scan a little bit further over the Higgs mass and the top mass, you can see that this is really a tiny endpoint in the, between the stability region and the, and, the, um, and the instability region. So, therefore, these, these are the, uh, of course, this is, has few assumptions in it, namely that there are no new physics mass scales, no new thresholds between the vacuum, ex between the VEF scale essentially and, you know, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 16, whatever, uh, GeV, okay, and the Planck scale essentially. But if that's the case, then uh, someday we will not have this conversation anymore, or future generations will not have this conversation anymore. But the hope is, of course, that something um, will happen before we start exploring 10 to the 19 GeV. And uh, how this will 
hopefully come about, we'll talk about tomorrow, where we talk really about Higgs physics at the LHC, and uh, how we can measure stuff, and how we measured stuff in, in particular, and what the implications are in, with all of this uh, unitarity violation business, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Depends. I mean, uh, you, you can get threshold contributions to this. So especially in the singlet model, you can get a positive contribution to lambda. Just, I mean, uh, the Higgs potential, for instance, um, allows you to have couplings like this, H1, H1 to H2. Yeah? So if you integrate that guy out, you get a new contribution to, uh, to the quartic. So if you have thresholds, then you can shoot yourself into uh, the positive lambda regime and thereby uh, essentially getting back into the stability region. So if, if you have new mass scales, they can alter both the RGE flow, obviously. Above the mass scale is relevant, but there are also threshold corrections that need to be taken into account. Yeah, that's one loop, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Explosion. I mean, there, you, there, there was a paper yesterday, right, by uh, uh, Jörg Jekyll, Tillman's colleague and a good friend of ours. So I think my opinion is it's probably wrong. Okay. Um, the uh, and a very simple argument. I mean, I can't pinpoint it. Why? Right? And I think if you talk to Valia and you talk to Michael, they will agree that this looks kind of weird. So, but nobody can really identify what's going wrong because these, uh, these you know, exploding uh, amplitudes with the, the number of legs that you have is really a, a semi-classical feature and it has been around for a very long time. So uh, my naive idea of how this can be uh, sort of circumvented is, um, and that's pretty much what Jörg did in the context of quantum mechanics, not really quantum field theory, is that the approximation that you do, that you do perturbation theory in the coupling constant is not really the, the appropriate one anymore. So it's a little bit like the Toft large end limit. Yeah? So uh, maybe there are you know, other quantities and Jörg identified and Jörg and his student, I should say, identify one particular quantity that exponentiates it and, you know, and just stims out this. I mean, if you change, for instance, the way you quantize your theory, maybe this would vanish in the uh, asymptotic states of the S matrix. So you would get this exponential damping. So one could, next step would, you know, can you actually come up with a Bogudyubov transformation that uh, changes the quantization conditions such that you can take Jörg's ideas over really to the, the Fourier mode decomposition of the scalar sector. And if you manage to do that, then that's the end of it. But of course, it's more work that's required there. Anything else? Everybody hungry, huh? Yeah, all right. OK, then tomorrow is uh, Paddy, and then at some point me, and then me again. And then we can all go and have a drink. All right, so thanks very much. <laughs>